Hello, my name is Kevin Bowers, pastor at Bethany Presbyterian Church, and I would like to welcome you to this worship experience for Sunday, August 23rd, offered by Bethany Presbyterian Church of Lafayette, Indiana, in partnership with Elston Presbyterian Church, also of Lafayette, and Memorial Presbyterian Church of Dayton, Indiana. We are glad that you have joined us for worship today and pray you will be blessed by this experience. We pray also that you are staying safe and well as we continue to distance ourselves from one another to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Out of concern for the well-being and safety of all within our communities of faith, our congregations have suspended in-person worship for the, for the foreseeable future and until further notice. So please plan to worship with us by video for the time being. Hunger Hike is an annual fundraiser to support the work of Lafayette Urban Ministry, Food Finders Food Bank, and the St. Thomas Aquinas Haiti Ministry. As one of the LUM member congregations, we welcome your support. But by supporting Hunger Hike, you go beyond just helping LUM. With one donation, you can help three local agencies to feed the homeless, provide food to struggling families who've lost their jobs due to COVID, give healthy snacks and meals to low-income children as they engage in the important work of learning and play, and provide hybrid seeds and clean water to struggling families in Haiti. Hunger Hike 2020 will be a virtual event, but there are still many ways for you to get involved. You can make a donation, support someone from your church who's become a fundraiser, or become a fundraiser yourself and either join a team or form one of your own. Everyone who raises at least $50 gets a Hunger Hike t-shirt, and those who raise at least $250 get a Hunger Hike Hero yard sign. From Sunday, September 13 to Sunday, September 20, we'll be having a challenge walk. Download the Stride Kick app and either create your own personal challenge for the week or participate in a leaderboard challenge with up to 10 members of your fundraising team to see who can get the most steps. Walk alone, walk with family, or get together with other members of your team for a fun, socially distanced walk. Take photos and post them to social media. With so many people out of work and struggling to pay the rent or put food on the table, we need your help now more than ever. Go to www.hungerhike.org or text HHike to 71777 to make a donation or become a fundraiser. But however you do it, please step up and support Hunger Hike. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
join me in the responsive call to worship. As one body, we have many members, each uniquely gifted for a particular purpose. We, we who are many are one body in Christ. Prophets and poets, thinkers and teachers, artists and advocates, consolers and caregivers. We, we who are many are one body in Christ. With thanksgiving, we offer our varied gifts in service to Christ, who makes us one. Let, Let us glorify the Lord. Lord. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us, all the days of our life. As God's forgiven people, receive this goodness and mercy and live a new life in the grace of Jesus Christ.
time of difficulties and being isolated, we should look forward to the opportunities that we can share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. The peace of Christ be with you, Laura. And also with you, Rick. And the peace of Christ be with you, Kevin. And also with you, Rick. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. God of revelation, mere flesh and blood cannot reveal divine truth. Only your spirit can give that gift. Be in my breath and voice. Be in our ears and understanding that through these words, your word may be known. Amen. Today's epistle lesson comes from Romans 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The Gospel reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Keep these words in your heart. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty and everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, you who are our strength and our redeemer. This we pray in the sure name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. It was a big week in the Bowers household. Yes, the kids and Jenny started back to school amidst a really crazy set of circumstances, but the most significant thing that happened is the number of Bowers in our household grew to five this week. On Wednesday, we appeared in court and the judge pronounced that the 10-year-old boy and 8-year-old girl who had been a part of our family for just over two years are now legally recognized as members of our family, complete with new last names. And I'm excited and happy to share this amazing news with you. 
But I'm not sharing this information just to brag about the good thing that happened in our lives this week. The reason I'm sharing this information in the context of this sermon is because it has had a major influence on how I reflect upon the passages of scripture we just read, especially the passage from the gospel according to Matthew, wherein Jesus asks the disciples, but who do you say that I am? It is likely that at some point all of us have had impressed upon us what it means to be a part of a family or some other organization. Perhaps our parents sat us down at one point and strongly impressed upon us the values of our family and instructed us that we should conduct ourselves accordingly at all times to uphold the family name. Perhaps you have been a part of a social club or a service organization with a particular mission statement and or code of conduct. In the six or more years that Jenny and I have been on this journey toward adoption, we have often been made to evaluate and consider what it means to be a part of our family. What are the traits of the Bowers family? What are the genetically inherited traits and what are the learned traits of our family? What are the values we hold and what do we wish to present about our family to the world? In other words, who are the Bowers and what does it mean to be one? Now all the emphasis put on behavior and talk about family traits is not just about identity, it, it's not just about having a sense of belonging, it's not just about hoping your children won't embarrass you. At a much deeper level, it is about instilling in them the values to guide them, not only through the calm waters of smooth sailing in life, but to equip them for the torrents and rapids to empower them to make the right decisions, the right choices, especially when the stakes are high and when there is considerable pressure and temptation to do the opposite, when quite literally their lives may depend on it. The same is true, I believe, for our family of faith. When we are adopted into the family of faith, when we are claimed as a child of God in our baptism, when we take on the identity of Christian, we are then part of and representatives of the family of God. We may all look different. We may have varying gifts, as the Apostle Paul points out in the passage we read from Romans. But we are all members of the same body of Christ. However we choose to bring our gifts to bear in the world, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Christ to the world. In order then to know the values and behaviors Jesus would have us carry into the world, we must first know something about him. When we know Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Gospels, we stand a better shot at not conforming to this world, instead living a cruciform life of service, justice, and love. I can't help but imagine that is what is behind Jesus' question, but who do you say that I am in the passage from Matthew? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. It is upon you, this rock, that I will build my church. I don't think Jesus is here looking for an academic explanation from the disciples. I think what he's really trying to discern is if they have understood 
what they have witnessed as they have followed him so that they will be equipped to continue his witness in his absence. We in the church have a tendency at times to get so heady, so caught up in our theology, in our answering that question of Jesus, that we forget that confessing Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, puts a demand on our very lives. There is a satirical reimagining of this passage that sometimes gets used in seminary and other theological settings that goes something like this. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the Kenosis, our feeling of absolute dependence and our ultimate ground of being. And Jesus said, Huh? <laughs> Again, I don't think Jesus is here looking for a deep theological answer. I think what Jesus is really trying to get at when he asks, but is, who am I to you? Peter's response, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Academically correct, but what seems to really excite Jesus isn't that Peter came up with the right answer. What prompts Jesus to say, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. What excites Jesus is the connection with God the answer reveals. There is no escaping. The question put to us modern day followers of Jesus, the question with which we have to wrestle today and every day when we wear the label Christian is, who do we say Jesus is? Yes, the Christ, the Son of the living God, as Peter said. But who do we say Jesus is and how we live? What Jesus do we portray to the world with our actions? When we find ourselves with a stark choice to conform to this world and remain safe or proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, what do we say then? This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. That is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said 75 years ago to a fellow prisoner on April 9th, 1945, before Gestapo guards took him away to be executed in a Nazi concentration camp at Flossenburg, Germany, because of his role in the Abur plot to oppose Hitler. I was reminded of the witness of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer this week when I listened to a podcast in which Reggie L. Williams, author of Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, was being interviewed. The book is an analysis of Bonhoeffer's exposure to the Harlem Renaissance intellectuals and worship at Harlem's Abyssinian Baptist Church during his year of postdoctoral study at Union Seminary in New York in 1930 to 31. This time in Bonhoeffer's short history was when he was strengthened, sharpened, his resolve increased to turn toward rather than away from people who were marginalized. Bonhoeffer, of course, didn't just naturally do this on his own. He felt it was what Christ compelled him to do. The question that mattered more than any other to Bonhoeffer 
and pressed upon him throughout his life right to the end was, who is Jesus Christ? It was the answer to that question that shaped Bonhoeffer's response to the rise of Nazism and the deliberate, systematic annihilation of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, mentally disabled people, and nearly anyone else who did not fit into the Aryan future Hitler had outlined for Germany. Their answer to who is Jesus Christ was the guiding light that compelled Bonhoeffer and others within the Confessing Church movement to stand in opposition to the evil of the Nazi regime when the majority of the Christian church in Germany failed to do so. The German church, of which the majority of Christians were members, not only failed to take a stand, but both pastors and members actively allowed the Christian tradition to be used by the Nazi government for corrupt purposes that directly contradicted the gospel and violated their own creeds and confessions. Can you imagine that? The life and witness of Dietrich Bonhoeffer ought to encourage us as each of us answers the question, who do I say? Jesus is. And Bonhoeffer's witness ought to also dissuade us from complicity in practices that contradict the gospel and bring shame to the name of Jesus the Christ. Stirred by the exuberant worship of the African American Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, Bonhoeffer noted the cushions on the pews of most Protestant churches in the United States. And, became, and that became for Bonhoeffer a metaphor for a church that had grown complacent in the face of suffering. A church that valued comfort more than commitment to the gospel. The church is once again staring into the face of suffering in multiple directions. And so we have a unique and powerful opportunity to be a dynamic witness for the gospel of Christ. And so who will we say Jesus is in this moment? Will we say that Jesus is the one who binds up the broken, who welcomes the outcast, who seeks out the least and the lost? Or will we say that Jesus is indifferent to suffering as long as we are not the ones who are suffering? What are the family values we will exhibit as children of God, brothers and sisters with Christ. I take hope and encouragement from this passage also, in that it was Peter who, by the power of the Spirit, came up with the right answer. Looking at the broader witness of the Gospels, we know that wasn't always the case for Peter. Remember the passage three weeks ago? It was to Peter, whom upon sinking, Jesus said, you of little faith. And later Jesus will also say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yet in this moment, Jesus praises Peter and says, that it is upon this rock that Jesus is going to build his church. What that says to me is that in order to be a part of, or even foundational in, the church of Jesus, 
doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. It does mean that you must keep on trying. Keep on following. Keep on listening for the still, small voice of the Spirit to know who and whose you are as you attempt to demonstrate for the world who Jesus is. When Peter names who Jesus is, Jesus declares who Peter is. There is a mutual revealing of true identity when we come to confess Jesus is Lord. And while we can never know God fully, given our human limitations, and while we change and grow, Jesus' Lordship remains constant. Jesus is ever always the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Naming, knowing, and clinging to this proclamation allows God to reveal to us who we are throughout our lifetime and in every circumstance. When our relationship to God is clear, our other priorities are more rightly ordered. For Bonhoeffer, it was a personal encounter with Jesus Christ that was necessary to discover a lived faith and not merely abstract belief in God. Bonhoeffer wrote from prison, Encounter with Jesus Christ is what matters. Faith is participation in this being of Jesus, incarnation, cross, resurrection. Our relation to God is not a religious relationship to the highest, most powerful, and best being imaginable. That is not authentic transition, transcendence. But our relation to God is a new life, existing for others through participation in the being of Jesus. A new life, existing for others through participation in the being of Jesus. May that be the Christ we show to the world. May that be our answer to Jesus' question. But who do you say that I am? Amen. Hello, friends. Today, I'll be singing for you, You Are My All in All.
Please join with me in the affirmation of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus, Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Join me now in the spirit of prayer. Dear gracious and holy God, we, your people, come before you in the spirit of prayer this morning. Humbled by your awesomeness, your mighty love, and your grace for us. We bask in your presence, and we are so grateful that you call us together as your people, that you welcome us into your presence. You invite us, encourage us to spend time with you. We thank you that you call us together to lift up our prayers, our joys, and our concerns, to give of us of all of our hearts and minds and souls to you. Gracious and Holy One, we pray that your spirit would be within us as we go out this week to live our lives. May we be examples of your love to those that we encounter. Help us to be living sacrifices, to give of all of ourselves, of all that we are and all that we have for your glory. Give us the courage to speak the truth in love. We pray, Lord, for the spirit of peace to be among our communities, for healing and wholeness to be with those who are suffering body, mind, and spirit. We pray for the beleaguered workers in hospitals and nursing homes and grocery stores around the world, those who are growing weary from being on the front lines. Grant them your strength, your courage, and your protection. Be with our children in schools and young adults as they embark on their college education this year. We thank you for those faithful teachers who continue to teach, be it remotely or in person. We pray for all of those who make going to school possible, for the school bus drivers, the administrators, and the secretaries, and the teachers, and the coaches. And we pray for their protection, gracious God. Help us, God, not to live in fear of what might happen in this life, not to live in fear of the virus or in fear of what may come next, but to trust you, to trust you with our very selves and our very lives. Help us to trust you as the body of Christ. For you have called us to be one in your Son, Jesus Christ. You have given us each gifts and talents and callings in our lives, presented ways for us to serve you and to serve those around us. Give us the courage and the faith to walk forward, trusting you. For you are our rock and our salvation, you make our very being possible. And so now, God, with the confidence of your children, we pray together that prayer that Jesus taught us as we boldly say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers.
brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. As an act of worship, let us now return to God our offering. We invite you, as you feel moved, to contribute to one of the three congregations participating in service today, Bethany Presbyterian Church, the Memorial Presbyterian Church, and Elston Presbyterian Church. Or contribute to the God's kingdom and to the upbuilding of God's kingdom in whatever way you are able to do, whether it's to make an offering or a donation of financial commitment, or whether it's to make an offering of yourself. Whatever is possible, we invite you to give to God as God has so generously given to us. Savior Jesus the Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now this day and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 